It's 106 miles to Chicago. We got a full tank of gas, half a pack of cigarettes. It's dark and we're wearing sunglasses. Hit it. And with that, for me, that was the start of the movies in the 80s. With a briefcase full of blues. They can't be stopped because they're on a mission for God. And a couple weeks ago, yeah, this is a you know comic book channel and stuff. A few weeks ago, I got involved in a conversation or something and somehow it came up and I figured, hey, you know, Maybe I'll just play around and do something with 80s movies and stuff, you know, just go ahead and give in to the nostalgia of it and stuff. Because actually there's a lot of great movies from there. Now, when DVDs first started coming out, I had a huge VHS collection, just huge, right? And, you know, I eventually got rid of it and stuff. And just to tell you how much, how many DVD, you know, VHS tapes I probably had at that time, I remember I took them to work and I was selling them three for five dollars as a favor. And I ended up making something like ninety-five dollars or something, so... You know, just go figure. I'll tell you how many movies I had. And then at one point, up to about 2008, I had probably anywhere between 400 and 450 DVDs, okay? And they were collecting dust. So over the years, I kind of whittled them down, bought things. I would get a bunch of them, take them to a store like FYE, trade them in to get, you know, other DVDs that were coming out. And this is kind of what survived here. I ended up having like a whole little shelf here of um, movies from the 80s and stuff. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna kind of go through with my memories, man. This isn't, you know, for uh, documentation. Everything's not gonna be crisp and perfect. It's just me talking about '80s movies and what I remember and my thoughts on them. Okay. So yeah, there'll be mistakes and yeah, there'll be movies I talk about I don't have here, but we're gonna go through it pretty quick. If this video interests anybody or anybody wants to talk about it and stuff, maybe I'll do somewhere on the line '80s sci-fi. Then maybe a video on '80s horrors I remember and stuff. Not the expert, but I was there, you know, so it's going to be like stories and stuff. And what was so cool here is that, like, in the 80s, the thing about movies that really made a difference and uh, kind of changed a whole lot of things is the fact that um, we had two things start happening. And, you know, I'm, I'm down on a mountain, I'm, you know, I'm down in southwestern Virginia and stuff, you know, so things were kind of slower than probably everywhere else. But we had the introduction of cable, HBO and Showtime. And then eventually, a few years after that, we started having the introduction of uh, video rental stores where you can get VHS tapes and you could like rent movies all of a sudden. Go home on your VCR if you had one and watch it at your leisure. You had a theater in your home all of a sudden. People were recording stuff off of TV. And really, that's kind of the era I grew up in where, you know, if you wanted a movie, you went and rented it. It was like part of your regular routine. About once a week, you might go get a few movies. You could keep them for a night, and then eventually I remember places where you can keep them up to like two or three days or whatever, but mostly it was like, you know, night at a time and stuff, and specials and stuff. Good, much cheaper than going to the theater, but people still went to the theater. And that's another thing that was a whole lot different. This was actually the start of the decline, at least around here, of the drive-in movies. You know, into the 70s they were like driving up, drying up and getting took down. And luckily we've got one in Abingdon, Virginia, a couple of my, I don't know, hour, hour and a half down the road for me that um, is still kicking called Blue Moon. And then uh, there's one in a place, I don't know, maybe 30 minutes past past a, a little town called uh, Princeton, Virginia. You go about 30, mi 30 miles up past it, there's a campground, they still have a movie theater. And I've seen them here and there. But the thing about it is, is that nowadays with movies in the summers, mostly and stuff like that, a movie might last in the theater, you know, a week or two. It doesn't really build up unless it's making money and then, you know, just however long it lasts. Man, back then, the movie theaters would recycle movies. Movies could be there for for weeks at a time. Maybe, I remember, I remember some movies being there for like two or three months, people kept seeing them and stuff. Or all of a sudden, like, you'd get like, <clears throat> Star Wars came out like in 1977. And, but all of a sudden, man, like I remember being in a theater in 1979 watching it again because they, they, they recycled the movies kind of floated around and stuff and they had cartoons. And this is also the end of showing a, a cartoon at the beginning of a movie and stuff like that. And I remember seeing Disney movies from the 50s and 60s and stuff like that in late 70s. But in the 80s, a whole lot of things changed and for the better in a way, I guess, because it, it actually became more of a bit more of an accessible uh, hobby, if you want to get even know it. It's easier to get entertained all of a sudden. And then, of course, the 80s, to me, for me, started with the Blues Brothers, right? And you're talking about a kid who was grown up uh, off and on on top of a coal mine town in a mountain where, you know, it was Bluegrass, Statler Brothers, I think Johnny Paycheck was hitting, Kenny Rogers was everywhere. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, 
but I had a grandmother who would play uh, some great music, Motown, uh, Phil Spector, girl bands, stuff like that, and we would dance around and stuff and watch American Bandstand and stuff with my grandmother when I was a kid. So when this came out and it was a musical, it just blew me away. Okay, so that's another thing, man. If you look at these two guys, you know anything about them, and I'm, many people do, you know, John Belushi, Dan Aykroyd, fresh off of uh, uh, Saturday Night Live, a lot of the way the 80s started, probably like with any decade, was there was harbingers from the previous decade. You had like uh, Steven Spielberg and George Lucas on the rise. You had Star Wars just do ever just reinvent, uh, you know, science fiction and stuff. You had uh, Halloween come out that just rejuvenated and created a whole new genre of horror, if you will, that kind of carried over. Um, you know, all kinds of things like that. Godfather, even though that was like around '73, man, it, it actually brought things into the '80s and stuff. But what also happened in the '80s is the movies really turned dark. Okay. I mean, it was everywhere. And we're talking like with family movies and kid movies and everything like that. I mean, we had things like The Black Cauldron from Disney. You know, things just kind of got dark. Uh, even with kids' movies and stuff, man, you had like The Dark Crystal coming out. You know, Jim Henson and his Muppets and stuff. And get ahead of myself there and stuff like that. And it was just, you know, the time of things going on. Another thing that started happening with the 80s movies is what I liked. It seems like they were about underdogs. Um, touched on social classes you know it wasn't the popular kids it wasn't about the rich and stuff it was these guys who were striving to be somebody and, and it was repression and stuff like that and it was the oddballs and the misfits and stuff and all of a sudden you had all these kids movies and, and stuff that were coming out where it was all about friends and, and helping your friends and everybody sticking together and kind of showing loyalty and stuff and you know that's why 80 movies are actually so fun when you watch them and stuff they were a little bit more about you know the characters and stuff than the situation they were in, but even the situation was cool. So you moved on and stuff like that, and you had like Saturday Night Live influence and everything. You know, the original cast had just, you know, they were done. Dan Aykroyd and Belushi left. Chevy Chase left years before that. Bill Murray left. They left, you know, Jane Curtin and a few of those guys, and they were out making movies. But then you had guys who were still around celebrity stuff making movies. You know, Steve Martin had come out. The Man with Two Brains and stuff like that. And another thing about this movie being about the 80s, you know, it was like John Landis was coming up. John Landis had uh, helped with uh, Harold Ramis and all them. John Belushi's first movie in Animal House. So the raunch film was coming out in the 80s. Yeah, it's a lot. You know, so uh, you had movies like Porky's and stuff like that. But for some reason, those raunchy films, you know, even though they had mandatory boob shots or whatnot, and they were about some really perverted stuff, man, it was still... It may not have been tasteful, man, but it wasn't like out and out perverted. It was actually kind of funny. They didn't go too far, and they were pushing a different kind of envelope back then, or something. It was still light. You, you still realized it was a, still kind of realized it was a, you know, just a comedy movie. Touch on his arms, and like I said, the sci-fi thing. What was going on is in Spielberg, and and Ridley Scott and stuff, guys were coming up, man. You got like dark movies like Blade Runner that came out with Harrison Ford, you know great movie and this movie has become more a cult favorite and stuff i think it did bomb in the box office and there's four versions of the movie and stuff but it's still kicking you know all because of uh you know star wars that was coming out and speaking of the sci-fi stuff check my little thingy here oh isn't that funny here we go coming off the heels of star wars and the cartoon of 1979 and stuff into the 80s man i may not have gotten to see the Empire Strikes Back in the theaters, but my Empire Strikes Back for me was the Flash Gordon. So if anybody's heard the uh, story of me telling how I got to see this, I'll go through it real quick. I begged and begged my stepdad to take me to see Empire, and he never took me. And all of a sudden, I don't know, you know, little kid memory here and stuff like that. Somewhere along the line, um, he was in the kitchen, and I was in the living room in the kitchen talking to a bunch of his buddies and just being real boisterous and stuff, and he talked about how uh, uh, Empire Strikes Back was badass and stuff, and I was trying to look at him, and we actually locked eyes, and that's probably the only time I actually felt like the man felt a little bit of shame. So sitting there being all mad and stuff like that, this was also a time in 1980 where kids could go outside and play, and you stayed out from morning to dark, and you uh, did stupid stuff with your friends, and you all kind of had your fights and stuff, but you were all friends, nobody else was allowed to pick on you. You ate candy, you ate junk, you wandered around, anything that was outside you played with, but you put it back in people's arms, you know, and stuff, uh, people's yards if you barred off of them. I'm talking like trash can lids if you're using them for shields while you were stick fighting, emulating what you saw in the movies. 
And this one right here, I ended up sneaking off with a friend on a Sunday with a pocket full of change. I would have a little glass bowl of just change that I would get out of, out of the laundry, out of, um, even at that age, out of the couches. And even at that age, I would go around collecting bottles and take them to the store and trading them in and stuff like that. So I had a pocket full of change and I paid to see Flash Gordon. I, rode, I walked the railroad tracks with some kid and it was probably about two, three, you know, I'm going to go ahead and say it was like maybe three or four miles, but we went and saw Flash Gordon and it blew me away. Now I was real, the whole thing about Queen doing the soundtrack, I was really confused because my Queen played another one Bites the Dust, you know, and then, so I was a little confused. But this was it for me. I would see Empire Strikes Back thanks to the rentals years later and stuff. I saw Return of the Jedi in the theaters after my mom took us down there to the mall and we stood in line for five hours. She stood in line most of the time, let us run back and forth and stuff. Good memory. And I would see Return of the, you know, Empire Strikes Back years later. Okay. And you know, I was always a fan, you know, black and white stuff, something like that. And then you had, like, real funny movies come out, man, like Caveman and stuff like that. And these weren't, like, big sensational hits, but they would end up on the cable shows, like TBS. And you watch them over and over. you talk to your friends at school. These were great movies and stuff. They were great. And like I said, where things were, like, getting dark, like we were talking about, stuff like that, you had this phenomenon came out. It was Secret and Them, okay? This was not a Disney movie, okay? This was not, you know... Great Mouse Detective, Rescuers Down Under, you know, Little Mermaid kind of brought them back and stuff. This was not the Black Cauldron and stuff, but all of a sudden this movie came out. Don Bluth was a Disney animator, and Disney had really made a lot of their cartoons kind of bland animation-wise, sending out all these memos of things you can't do while you're animating. So Don Bluth and some of his uh, buddies, or however he found them, would spend weekends animating The Secret of Nim. And this is about, uh, a, you know, Miss Brisby, based on a children's novel, uh, the rats in them, but Miss Brisby had a sick child and she was trying to seek out a way to cure him of what would be pneumonia because the frost were coming or something like that and they lived in a cinder block in the middle of a field and the farmer would come out and start chopping the wood and stuff and they had to move and everything like that. And it's dark, she ends up meeting an owl and around that owl in his hood and stuff like that is are the bones of rodents and stuff. Uh, the, the colors were just amazing and stuff, and the mood was set, and the rats were scary looking, and the owl was scary looking. He was cocking his head, moving like a real owl, you know, that way they turned their necks and stuff, and the animation was just glorious and stuff, and it was just full and bright and stuff, but it was a very dark story, you know. And then, uh, you know, you continue with that stuff. Of course, how can we talk about the 80s without, like, the Steven Spielberg influence and stuff, you know, sci-fi. And to this day, this is probably why I eat these. E.T. came out. Um, I'm trying to think. I actually think this was written by, I think, Steven Spielberg's wife or something at the time or something. I don't know. Somebody's wife wrote this. E.T. This is the story of a boy and his alien. And it was, you know, made a star out of Elliot out of it. The kid that played Elliot. Uh, what was his name? Henry Thomas, I think. And stuff like that. And that led to you starting to connect the dots because before he was in that, he was in a movie about kids getting caught in the spy ring and playing video games and playing uh, role-playing games that were coming out, Reflection of the Times and stuff, in a, movie, a little movie called Cloak and Dagger, you know, which was just amazing because anybody could have been this kid. It didn't matter if he was in Texas. He ends up finding, like, a video game, which is basically an Atari video game, Let's, uh, and they can tell there's something special going on it, and it ends up having a chip that unlocks when you beat the game or reach a certain score or something. All of a sudden, you have all these uh, killers after you and stuff. You know, and at the same time, our little screwed up kid whose mom has died, he's having problems getting along with his dad who's in the Air Force, you know, he's in the Air Force or something like that. He's in the military and he keeps, uh, you know, having, uh, he keeps picturing Jack Flagg, who's like a role playing character or something, his hero, you know, trying to make peace with his dad a little bit. Um, and of course, the Steven Spielberg thing and George Lucas thing kind of met up with each other. I just had him right here. With, of course, the Indiana Jones movies, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Temple of Doom, you know, ended towards the 80s with The Last Crusade where they brought in Sean Connery and River Phoenix and stuff, all these 80s things, you know. So you can kind of track the movies of the 80s with, you know, how the uh, Indiana Jones movies were kind of laid out there with Harrison Ford and stuff. You know, just all of a sudden it's like action and adventure and it's heralding back to old movie serials of the 30s and it's bringing back Nazis and stuff, man. It was bringing in a nostalgic wave and introducing a whole new generation of, you know, just all kinds of cliffhanger action and stuff. It's just amazing. 
George Lucas and, of course, Steven Spielberg, everybody knows, we've become like juggernauts, you know, to this day, more or less. Um, yeah, there's all kinds of stuff here. We also had, like, one of our biggest stars and stuff that came up. You know, we had, like, Conan the Barbarian. Mine is actually signed by uh, Roy Thomas, who wrote the script. Um, who else did he write it with? Gary Conway. You know, they came out with the Conan movies. Also, we have uh, Schwarzenegger, who had little bit parts in the 70s and stuff. Uh, because of his physique and stuff, actually came out and tried to be an actor and stuff, and got an instant classic in this. And then we got the more tongue-in-cheek one a little bit later, coming into the Destroyer. And then all of a sudden, man, everybody's just, it's all kind of sword fighting again, and Oliver Stone was coming up and everything like that. And of course, you know, we can't be sold out because of, uh, you know, we got the introduction of Nick Cage and, you know, a cult classic with Valley Girl here. All of a sudden, everybody got introduced, uh, you know, national wide there to you know the girl valley girl accent and stuff and nick cage and the music and different scenes and basically it's romeo and juliet retold in uh, the valley you know san fernando you know this, this funny stuff that was all you know stuff like that and of course i mentioned george lucas and stuff let's not forget he had his flops howard the duck which i thought was great but leah thomas is just amazing in this i mean you know back to the future and roger zemeckis and all that stuff you know all we had our 80s stars and stuff and then we were speaking of like Blade Runner and stuff. Uh, what a lot of people don't realize, and what I think I figured out now, it's no, you know, other people figured it out way before I did. You know, Ridley Scott movies like Blade Runner and Alien and stuff like that uh, all tied in, legend ties in. Okay, we had the great Tom Cruise coming here when Tom Cruise was just getting started. This is one of those movies you forget it's Tom Cruise, man. We had like, also we had fantasy. We had that fantasy come up, man. We had legends about unicorns and, and trolls and fairies and Tim Curry playing darkness and you know, epic proportions here, and just just neat little movies like that and stuff that you would actually look at the screen and you would like study the background and stuff and what was going on. Um, then you had like the movies that I like about like the Band of Friends and stuff like that. I have all these in chronological order, so I'm looking to see what I'm doing for you guys. Um, you know, you had a whole bunch of movies, and I'll probably throw out a little bit more and stuff. You had all these really cool movies and stuff like that, like The Outsiders came out, and uh, what was the chick's name? This is Francis Ford Coppola. He's the guy that helped get George Lucas started, I think, in, um, in the 70s and stuff, and he comes out with this masterpiece. And these were based on novels by a girl who was uh, S.E. Hinton. She was 17 years old when she wrote The Outsiders, still in high school, and then she wrote a movie called Rumblefish that followed it. Okay, but these movies came out with Pony Boy Curtis and stuff, and all of a sudden there was a big gang fight at the end of this that, you know, people were yelling, you know, violence and stuff like that. And it, is, it can be pretty brutal, man, but it's about, um, it's the early 60s, man, where the greasers were still kicking. It's not about the hippies, and, and there's a girl named Cherry, and you have Pony Boy and Soda Pop, and uh, I think it was, that his, was it Daryl? Daryl was his brother by Patrick Swayze. You know, and, and look at the guys that were in this movie, you know. Matt Dillon, one of the most underrated actors of ever, I think, of his time. Patrick Swayze, man, the man who could do to this and Red Dawn, I demanded no wrong in my eyes. I mean, I can watch a Dirty Dancing because of Swayze in a weird way. And then Ghost, he made it bearable, you know, to me. You know, I mean, those are not those movies aren't made for me in particular, but, you know, it had Swayze in it, man. Rob Lowe, Tom Cruise before he was famous, who was actually, they said he was so good looking, they had to give him some fake teeth to ugly him up, even though he didn't have that many. You know, Ralph Macchio, who had the Karate Kid, the Karate Kid, our Rocky of the freaking, uh, of the 80s for us there, for kids and stuff like that. You know, and uh, Emilio Estevez, and even has Leif Garrett in it, who I didn't know it was Leif Garrett in it. You know, he plays a Soch, the greasers in the Soch in gang fights. But it's also about sticking together with your friends and family because, you know, everybody's parents are either dead or they beat them or they're drunk and they don't care and stuff like that. And, it, you know, this is one of the first movies I watched where it had a little line in there where I really was like, I, I, I thought it was the greatest line in the movie ever, and apparently I was the only one that picked it up, man. The socials, like, pull up on Cherry, you know, their, one of their girlfriends stuff, walking with Emilio Estevez and Pony Boy and stuff, and about to get jumped. Emilio Estevez reaches down, gets two ponies a beer that are sitting there, breaks them on the gas, on the, on, breaks the glass, and, you know, makes a little knife, you know, a little glass knife there to stab him, tosses it to Pony Boy, tosses the switchblade to Pony Boy, and they said something like, don't get any ideas, we got three guys in the back seat, and Emilio Estevez looks at him and goes, pity the back seat. I was just like, yeah, you know. Then he had real touching movies, like Stand By Me, where a bunch of four friends just want to go out and see a dead body and be heroes by reporting the body, 
because they heard one of their other brothers say they knew where it was. Like some kid had gotten hit by a train, but everybody thinks it's, uh, it's um, you know, he might just be missing or something. I think this is the late 50s, early 60s and stuff. Great soundtrack, and it's based on a Stephen King book called uh, The Body, a little novella that he had, a little short story, man. And it's Will Wheaton, River Phoenix, Corey Feldman, Jerry O'Connor, Kiefer Sutherland. Um, and it's just about coming of age and boys and remembering friends and stuff and their future. I mean, it's, it's, just, it's just a real good movie because it's about these characters and things that to them are just like the things that they, they run across while they're doing this railroad track and they get leeches on them and uh, Will Wheaton passes out because he looks down and he sees a leech on his, on his, on his you know, little Will Wheaton, you know, and he passes out and they have a train, they're on a, they're crossing a bridge on a gigantic railroad track and a train's coming and stuff. Just great, man. It reminded you of friends and just how kids used to hang out and stuff like that. And even though this was like in this, I think this takes place in the late 50s, early 60s, this is how it was when I was growing up. You know, but I skipped ahead there with Rumblefish. We had something a little bit different. It's it's in the same town. They filmed it in the same town as The Outsiders, and everybody's real excited to see this movie. But uh, it, it's this is more of a Greek tragedy kind of movie, kind of an artsy movie for Francis Ford Coppola. It's got the motorcycle kid. Uh, it's got Mickey R Mickey Rourke, one of the greatest actor, tough guy actors of all time, I think. Uh, Diane Lane in it. You know, Nicholas Cage is also in this. And it's got Dennis Hopper. You know, just a real good movie. Rumblefish. So we can go on and on as you see about these movies and stuff like that. You had the Terry Gilliam movies that came out that were really weird. Fisher King, Baron Munchausen, in Brazil. Uh, just movies that kind of, you know, just strike visually striking and stuff and just really deep and dark and dark movies. They had a dark side to them like we were talking about. You had the other movies that were coming out um, that were Joe Dante movies that were kind of dark, man. You have gremlins that would suck you in with the fuzzy little mogwai. And mogwai is like a Cantonese word or a Korean word or an Asian word or something that does mean gremlins and stuff. But you, they set up these cool rules. And it's kind of like black humor is what this actually was and stuff because everybody knows about the mogwais. Hopefully you feed them after midnight or if you get them wet. Uh, I can't remember the third rule. How funny. And it's where I'm doing this. We all know the rules. Anyway... But this is actually like a horror story set during Christmas. These grim they turn into gremlins and they multiply. I don't, don't let them into see sunlight. That's it. And stuff like that. And then they even made one a little bit funnier there towards the uh, end of the 80s, there, 89 and stuff. But just, you know, dark, funny little movies that were cool little creatures. And this spawned all kinds of little other movies that were like, you know, B-movie takes of them like critters and stuff. That were actually fun on their own. Um... Uh, and then the two movies I just had to talk about real quick here, man, is like Labyrinth and Dark Crystal, man. These were family movies with a little dark edge, and then they, they brought in Labyrinth. And this was like from uh, Jim Henson Studios. Jim Henson actually wrote this, this epic story of something that's just completely alien and a completely different world. I mean, he took uh, puppetry and movie sets and stuff and went further than they ever could have been. Well, I mean, was it a great story? It had holes, but it has held up. Big cult following. Labyrinth, of course, man. We get... Um, Jennifer Connelly, man, debuting in her first movie, man, and I gotta tell you, man, after growing up watching Linda Carter on Wonder Woman, you know, the dark-haired girls and stuff like that still had them and stuff, and you had David Bowie doing this excellent, even the music was a great part of this, and if you grew up watching the Muppets and stuff like this, you saw how far they came again, just a great little story, and uh, Terry Jones, uh, Monty Python fame, I think he helped write it, was it Terry Jones? Yeah, Terry Jones, screenplay by Terry Jones, story by Dennis Lee and Jim Henson. So we have a little swipe of Monty Python in there. Uh, and then we had the horror movies that came out were just freaking awesome and stuff like that, man. Um, you know, stuff, my, some of my favorites here, man, you know, The Return of the Living Dead. Just a big tongue-in-cheek, great zombie movie, you know. Send more cops, they wanted brains and stuff like that. Then you had George Romero and Stephen King get together, man, and they did a tribute to EC Comics of the 50s that they grew up on, Creep Show. You had, like, the resurgence of, like, special effects and stuff for Academy Award winning stuff, like an American Werewolf in London. And you had, like, these wicked little movies that kind of made you feel kind of like you needed a shower, like the howling and stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, so I think you get the idea and stuff. Uh, just some other movies I got here, you know, you had comedy, the Star Wars thing went on and on with the Trinity Jedi stuff. We had like one of Mel Brooks' greatest movies, uh, Spaceballs, 
I think the only other movie that might be better than it, in my opinion, really is uh, Young Frankenstein, you know, but, you know, different decade, you know, different things like that. You had uh, some really mind-tripping little movies come out, uh, offbeat movies and stuff like uh, Blue Velvet by uh, David Lynch, the David Lynch movies that came out. He had, he, he started out in the 70s with like a racer head. <clears throat> Then he had, like, The Elephant Man came out in the 80s, which I couldn't handle that movie. That just freaked me out. And then he had Dune come out, which was just, like, a complete flop. So he brought it back down and did a bit more of a less budget and came out with just a mind trip of Blue Velvet with one of Dennis Hopper's greatest scenes ever in there. Um, what else we got here since you're sticking in here? Go along with the, uh, you know, Fright Night came out. It harkened back to, um, you know, B-movies of the 50s and 60s and stuff and brought in vampires. You know, just fun movies that you would watch. And to go along to kind of mix that with the other kid movies I had. Yep, I'm getting in a mess here. And one of my time favorites, they had movies, the cult movies were like coming out a little bit more and a little bit more. People were able to rent them, man. Monster Squad came out. You know, this is like the Goonies meets the Creep Show in a way. Um, maybe a bit more like Fright Night and stuff. But it had all the classic villains come back in this small town, and it's a bunch of Goonie-like kids, you know, trying to do it. Now, I don't think this really did well in the theater, man, but this was like a freaking rental that you would have to go in three or four times before you actually found it because everybody steadily kept getting this. You know, great memories with it. And then you have, like, the greatest movie of the 80s, in my opinion, The Goonies, because if you were 12, 13, 14, 15 years old, probably even 10 in 1985, if you're, like, in a five-year period there, where you're the same age as these kids and stuff, you were The Goonies. This is how you played. You had your bikes and stuff going on. These guys just happened to find a treasure map and met some weird people and stuff. And uh, it's just a masterpiece. I mean, to me, Goonies is, like, you know, right dead set in the middle of the 80s. And nothing captures that period just like this and you know, how you played. You had fun movies and stuff like that. You had like Ghostbusters. You had like uh, more Monty Python stuff. Dr. Detroit, you know, uh, the Saturday Night Live thing kept going. Ghostbusters never never lost a following even after that. We're in the second movie. You had Big Trouble in Little China. You know, just great fun movies, you know. Just out of nowhere, man, you'd be like, what am I watching? And it was just so, felt like it was so spontaneous. You didn't know where the story was going. They weren't predictable and stuff and had all these influences. And there's stuff you could laugh at in them and stuff that would wow you. And then you had the movies that were like, it could have been you. You had these movies where it just could have been you, man. Like The Last Starfighter. You can become, uh, you know, you can join this intergalactic war if you beat a video game out in the middle of the desert at a gas station. If you beat the, it was actually a training manual. And it also recruited people. If you beat the game, it's you know, they would come get you and you would join. You had John Cusack movies like Better Off Dead. Real quirky, low-budget movies, One Crazy Summer, that were just, you know, you'd laugh about, but you kind of related to the guy chasing the girl or something. You had the John uh, Hughes movies that are staples of the 80s, man. Sixteen Candles, you know, uh, Donga Need the Food, you know, Weird Science, you know, just great stuff uh, coming off the, you know. Um... And then you continue with the John Dante movies, man, like what we're going off, the Explorers, the sci-fi stuff and the kid stuff and the underdog stuff all met up with, like, the Explorers and stuff. Uh, the ending got messed up because they pulled it out from under John Don Joe Dante, but up until they actually meet the aliens, it's an awesome, awesome thing. And, you know, I think you get the idea, man. I didn't touch the Tim Burton stuff. There's so many good things, but that's a good start, you know. And, uh, you know, just remember the 80s and stuff like that. But real quick, Land, you had like these other movies that came out, and it was because of the rentals you could watch them in. You had like Heavy Metal come out. You had Star Chaser come out. Stuff I've talked about before. Fire and Ice, Frank Frazetta, Ralph Bashke, Roy Thomas. Just great stuff, man. You know, that would make you fall in love. But, uh, you know, I think you kind of get the idea. I can go on and on and on. You know, I can go on with the B movies, you know, that you got Warren from Outer Space, Alien in L.A. Um, cult movies like Invaders from Mars, Strange Invaders. Invaders from Mars was a remake of a 50s movie that I actually loved. This was the one, this was the one that got me, you know. Um, then you had those movies on TBS like Hawk the Slayer, you know, look that up on the trailer, man. God awful bad, but so bad it's good. It's great. Beastmaster. And you had like Inner Space come out where they were like playing around with this, with, uh, you know, remaking some 60s movies with the special effects of the 80s and stuff. And it, that's back when you could actually do a remake and improve on it instead of, you know, what they do now. But I think you get the idea. I think you get the idea. 
So thanks for hanging in there. Sorry this went 30 minutes, but hopefully you had fun.